Welcome everybody to the Dean Seminar. I'm Elizabeth Dunn, the Dean of CLAS, and it's always a pleasure to introduce faculty uh, who talk about their work at the Dean Seminars. And you all know I'm a historian, and historians will steal anything from anyone to teach with. And I've always loved art historians because they have great, great stuff to steal uh, to capture and hold students' attention. And one of my goals is always to activate their imagination about the past and what it looks like. So art comes in very handy, and concepts from art history come in handy too. So it's my pleasure to introduce Micheline Nielsen today. Um, she has her PhD from, in art history from the University of Delaware, and she came to ISB in 2004, is that correct? OK, good. So she's been with us for a while. And um, art history moved into CLAS. Has it been three years, Micheline? Yeah, three years ago. Uh, we've been really happy to have them in CLAS and have really enjoyed it. Uh, Micheline, in particular, comes to us as a distinguished professor. She won the research award, the campus research award, last year. And I myself knew nothing about allotments until I started looking at her materials and hearing her talk about it. And if you watch British TV at all, you know that they refer to the allotments a lot. But I and I kind of knew it was a like community gardens, but I didn't realize how rich the history was, uh, both visually and uh, written, and the kind of social implications of all of that. So that's been a lot of fun to learn about from Micheline. And today she's going to talk about a slightly different topic, but uh, early French environmentalists. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I do have to say it's been very nice to be in CLAS for the past uh, three, almost three and a half years now. Um, so thank you for coming. And I first want to uh, kind of explain that this is an offshoot of the research for my book on allotment gardens between 1920 to 1980 in Europe, which continues the work that I published up to 1919. So towards the end of this period between 20 and 80, uh, ecological concerns in the wake of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, published in 62, uh, begin to have a si significant impact on the demand for allotments. And although I needed to account for that in the book, I could only include a very, very brief outline of this fascinating material. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity for a longer visit with this topic uh, to prepare for speaking with you, but also possibly to work it into a more full-fledged research project. So um, early French environmentalists writing in 1637, the French philosopher René Descartes stated that we make ourselves masters and possessors of nature by subjecting our material environment first to rational analysis and then to technological control. Many ecologists share the notion that this Cartesian position provided a scientific sanction for the manipulation and exploitation of nature that is viewed as typical of Western culture. As the land of artifice, France provided an uphill battle for the ecology movement to gain credit there. If we think of the mindset that created the geometrically controlled uh, uh, image of the world that was embodied in the gardens at Versailles, it becomes um, plausible to view France as, in the worth, works <coughs> of the American scholar Kerry Whiteside, barren ground for the cultivation of environmental concerns. Ecological concerns in France are usually considered to have surfaced later than in other countries. Most of the literature on this topic focuses on the 1960s and 1970s, especially after the creation of the French Ministry of the Environment in 1971. Whiteside argues that this point of view is unjustified because the French have, since, according to Whiteside, the 1950s, generated an abundant literature of, on environmental political thought. He attributes the lack of recognition of French ecological discourse in the English-speaking world to the fact that the common distinction between anthropos anthropocentrist and ecocentrist ecologies does not obtain in, the, in French green theory. French theorists have tended to study how conceptions of nature and human identity are intertwined. 
they posit that the very meaning of being human is tied up with our construction of nature. These theorists derive their position on ecology from, from a humanist tradition that draws from thinkers such as Montaigne, Pascal, and Rousseau. These humanists encourage questioning of facile assumption about human nature and tone down the hubris of Cartesian humanism. Humanism becomes ecological when it opens itself to reflecting on how nature and humanity are mutually defining. There is ample evidence that environmental concerns were concretized through a number of French institutions, policies, and programs during the, an the Ancien Régime, and that they had been steadily addressed um, as of the French Revolution. Forest management provides concrete examples. Most of the ancient forests in central France had been felled by the early 13th century. François Ier uh, had issued regulations to protect royal, ecclesiastical, and private forests. Louis XIV had resolved very early uh, in his reign in 1662 to address the disorder of the forests and he and his minister Colbert had initiated a forest policy and ordinance as of 1669. French royal forests and private estates had integrated some of the numerous species of American trees, there were about 30 European species and over 100 species of American trees, such as those um, that had been sent by Thomas Jefferson and those scouted by a French botanist, André Michaud, uh, who had been sent to the New World by Louis XVI. Measures of reforestation had also been undertaken under Louis XVI. As one of his last actions as king, Louis XVI had also sought to protect royal forests by placing them under the protection of municipalities uh, by a, procla a proclamation issued on the 3rd of no November 1789, that is four months after the taking of the Bastille. As the revolutionary regime was implemented, the populace took over the forest and exploited them indiscriminately. On this, the French 19th century historian Jules Michelet wrote, trees were sacrificed for trivial uses. Two pine trees would be felled to make a pair of clogs. And opening of the royal forest to cattle resulted in damage to the trees, especially to young saplings, which are crucial for forest regeneration. This resulted in the devastation of forest, especially in the Alps. In, in 1808, Louis Ramon de Carbonnière, who was a French politician, geologist, and a botanist, and also the pioneering explorer of the Pyrenees Mountains, wrote, one century of man weighs heavier on the earth than 20 centuries of nature. The pre-revolutionary concern for forest was revived during the Restoration. A prestigious school of forestry was founded in 1824 in Nancy, um, you see the gate there, it's still in existence today, and it is the school where uh, Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the United States Forest Services, would, a few decades later, learn professional forest management. The reestablishment of the Water and Forest Administration, also in 1824, was followed by the exact enactment of a post-revolution forest code in 1827. So, you know, there was action. Uh, going on at the government level. But the impact of the deforesta deforestation that had occurred, especially in the Alps, became perceptible in France between 1840 and 1870, resulting in torrential floods, especially in the Rhone Valley. Um, Edward Baldus was dispatched by the government to photograph those floods, and you see one of those 19th century photographs. The state implemented and enforced regulations to curb peasant use and promote reforestation, and it encountered widespread resistance, sometimes violent and persistent violations. Reforestation efforts were also implemented by the state land, ma land management agency, the O and Forest, the Water and Forest um, Administration, to mitigate the em environmental impact of wood production. 
Under the Second Empire, a new understanding of landscape would be art articulated in the conflict about the historic forest of Fontainebleau, uh, which is 35 miles southeast of Paris, and uh, it was an old royal domain that consisted of about 45,000 acres. Um, artists, as for instance those of the Barbizon School, were intent on preserving the landscape of the old forest, where they had been very active in painting, um, and where the introduction of the pine was threatening the historical oaks and beeches, which were viewed as the, the real nature of these forests. So the Barbizon school painter Theodore Rousseau drafted a petition for the emperor in 1852. Foresters, assuming a conservationist position, argued for the need to manage the natural resources of the forest and use them judiciously. Napoleon III, however, responded uh, to the artist's concern by designating about 4,000 acres, a little over 6% of the forest, as an artistic reserve which was off limits for cutting or replanting. That was the first French government protection for a specific landscape. In a recent book on the Paris Commune, which followed right after the Second Empire in 1871, uh, Christine Ross in 2015 examines the figures of the, the two, uh, the communard and geographer Elisée Reclus, and of the Russian philosopher, scientist, and activist Peter Kropotkin. And both were advocates of a form of proto-ecologism that is being recognized today. In The Conquest of Bread, Kropotkin used the 1871 Paris Commune, or revolution, as the basis for his anarchist uh, scenario of agricultural self-sufficiency that would transform all available land, including public parks, and especially the private lands of the gentry of the Paris region, into high-yield vegetable gardens. As geographers, Kropotkin and Reclus were cognizant of the damage that capitalism wreaks on the environment. Reclus even foresaw a development of an agribusiness that would reduce the vast majority of people to slaves. His words. As suggested by the title of Kropotkin's 1902 publication, titled Mutual Aid, he, he and other geographers contributing to Reclus' Nouvelle Géographie Universelle, which is a series of uh, books that were published between 1876 and 1894. Um, so these uh, writers began to articulate a concept of solidarity between their species that differed uh, significantly from the Malthusian-inspired Darwinian evolutionism. Reclus and Kropotkin had a broad conception of the natural world where they envisioned a continuity between animals and humans. As pointed out by the sociologist Ronald Craig, geographical study before the splintering of the discipline into subfields had an inherently proto-ecological dimension. Both Kropotkin's and Reclus's understanding of science prompted them to articulate a relationship between man and the natural world that would be sustainable. In his last work, L'homme et la terre, man and the earth, Reclus defined humanity as nat nature becoming conscious of itself. Uh, Reclus warned of the dangers of unsustainable industrialization and of those inherent in ecological concerns such as loss of biodiversity, introduction of non-native species, or aggressive deforestation. In a 1981 issue of the French journal titled Herodot, which was devoted en entirely to El Elisee Reclus, its editor, Beatrice Gibling, indicated that Reclus' global ecological sensibility was eclipsed at uh, his death for al almost um, a half a century, a point that Christine Ross also e echoed in the uh, recent book. Environmental concerns did not, however, become entirely dormant. As early as 1876, uh, Mr. Trottier, who was an agronomist working in Algeria, had articulated the notion that destruction of forests had the potential to change permanently the character of a country and its inhabitants, 
and that deforestation heralded national decline. During the first decades of the 20th century, the di divergence of opinion that had pitted preservationists and conservationists about the forest of Fontainebleau was debated in the context of colonial exploitation of forest resources. Preservationists had the non-utilitarian goal of protecting aesthetic aspects of nature and landscape for historical and cultural reasons. Conservationism advocated the judicious use of resources and their management to safeguard their continued existence and productivity. So the preservation of metropolitan France was differentiated from the conservation of the non-European landscape of the colonies. The environmental impact of landscape management in the colonies was considered from the point of view of potential threat to European civilization and due to Europeans perceived at the time colonial domination to that of the world. Scientists and colonial administrators debated the form that landscape protection should assume in the colonies. A dominant concept of landscape as an ed ecological system emerged, although aesthetic and um, aesthetic appeal and the facilitation of tourism was not excluded from consideration. Um, indigenous populations, however, were excluded from the landscapes that were essentially approached as unpeopled. In the French colonies, the unpeopled landscape was conserved to stave off the environmental devastation of world civilization while allowing its profit-driven exploitation. The role of the forest as a refuge from industrial and urban life sparked the foundation of a number of associations, such as the Touring Club of France in 1890, on the establishment in 1901 of a Society for the Protection of the Landscapes of France that sponsored the first French law for the protection of natural sites and monuments passed in April 1906. So this law codified the extension of the concept of national patrimony that had already been um, encouraged by the French government and photography of monuments in the early um, shortly after, about 1850 in, uh, in France. Um, so uh, the protection would now extend to aspects of the natural world with historic significance. So the preservationist discourse of metropolitan, metropolitan France focused also on protecting the rural economy that harked back to pre-industrial the past, um, a context in which ecological concerns remained ma marginal. By 1922, the protective role of forests was recognized by a law that instituted their use against soil erosion and avalanches. So that was applied to the mountain landscapes of the, of the Alps primarily. In addition to physical and political geography, the field of human geography had emerged by the turn of the century. And during the interwar period, a set of more diverse approaches evolved into urban, cultural, and economic geography. Two landmark publications from that time period include Gaston Houpnel's um, 1932 History of the French Countryside and Roger, Roger Dion's um, essay on the formation of the French rural landscape, published both in 1932 and 34, two volumes. And these reflected a focus on rural France that was compatible with the French, the metropolitan France preservationist agenda. But terms such as environment or ecology, however, did not appear in the French geographical discourse until the 1970s. During World War II, the back to the land ideology of the Fichy National Revolution, that is the government that um, presided over non-occupied France, also included efforts in parts manned by the French youth workforce to turn wasteland and forest to productive use and reclaim ma marginal lands such as marshes or wetlands. 
Most of these attempts were unsuccessful, France ending the war with almost 3 million fewer hectares under cultivation than in 1938, which represented a loss of 7% of the country's total area. Although significant developments in environmental policy would not occur in France until later than in other countries, environmental concerns were articulated and published during the post-war year. Years. Uh, the biologist and mycologist Roger Hine, uh, possibly better known for his work on hallucinogenic mushrooms, was a precursor <laughs> in environmental science. Heim was the director of the French National Museum of Natural History from 1951 to 1965 and president of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature from 54 to 58. He presided over the 8th International Botanical Congress in Paris in 1954. His book, uh, Destruction and Protection of Nature, published in 1952, introduced a concern for biodiversity that was not articulated by his contemporaries. Extracts from the book were um, published in the popular weekly Paris Match and French radio programs uh, held discussions about the content of the book. Heim would edit uh, two ad additional uh, publications pertaining to environmental concerns, in addition to all his books about mushrooms. Um, and that was an atlas of world natural reserves in 1956, and then an anthology of environmental texts um, titled The Anxiety of the Year 2000, When Nature Will Be Gone, Man Will Follow. Uh, the latter includes the preface to the French edition of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, a review of the book, and a eulogy of the American author. Heim also expressed his concern about post-war housing development. On the occasion of his induction, he got around, into the Academy of Architecture on the 9th of November 1964, he spoke in very critical terms about these large housing estates that were popping up all around the, the French cities. And he stated, man, here as elsewhere, has inverted the law of logic and nature. This is how the large housing estates were created, their conceptions appearing to us today, at least to the eyes of many among us, as both the most anti-rational and anti-natural achievements that some builders of the 20th century have conceived and fabricated. He also re referred to the work of Pierre Soudreau, the former minister of construction, uh, and advocating for a more organic form of housing based on instinctive needs and complex processes rather than a rational and systematic deployment of modernist principles. It doesn't appear that Heim's environmental writings have been translated into English, and they may not have even been read widely. Copies of his 1952 publication were available with uncut pages in 2015. When I bought mine, it came, you know, I had to cut the pages. <laughs> um, Rachel Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring, was published in French, uh, in French translation by the influential publisher Plon in May 1963, so very shortly, and it reached a third printing uh, within six weeks. With Roger Heim's preface, the book came highly recommended. It was followed two years later by uh, Before Nature Dies by Jean Dorst, um, who, as Heim, would also become director of the French Museum of Natural History. You see him depicted here with um, Audubon plates he's uh, discussing. Um, Dort's book would spark the founding of several French nature prote protection associations. The French scientific establishment responded to Carson's book by pointing to the French government's pesticides registration system. Um, which allegedly ensured public health protection. This registration system, um, administered by the Ministry of Agriculture, <coughs> had been instituted under the Vichy government, so during the war, to monitor the fabrication of chemicals, but not to monitor their impact. The only public health aspect of the system included in this legislation was the protection of agricultural workers. 
So this registration system would be adjusted in 1972, but without really providing substantially greater public health protection. So Europeans didn't want to believe that Silent Spring applied to Europe. These things could happen in America, and Europe could definitely learn from American mistakes. So Europe, at that time, 62, were beginning to emerge from the impact of the war. And to achieve some economic stability, you know, in the early 1960s. By 1962, the U.S. had enjoyed over a decade of economic growth and prosperity. They felt secure enough to criticize the problem caused by this growth. As pointed out by the ethnologist Françoise Dubost, the French public had little interest in the abstract concept of the environment when described on a planetary scale by ecologists. On a more concrete level, garden plants, either ornamental or for consumption, struck a chord uh, when they were viewed as threatened patrimony that would no longer be available to be passed on to future generations because of what was occurring at the more abstract level of the environment. The desire to preserve a common ecological patrimony and safeguard local, regional, or threatened plant, plant species mobilized into effective associative structures people from different walks of life. They set in motion, at a vernacular level, the concept of conservation, which had been preoccupying the scientific community um, as early as the, uh, the end of the war. The French Minister, Ministry of the Environment was established in 1971, actually a couple of years before uh, the energy crisis. Legislation for the protection of water resource had been passed in 1964, but laws about air pollution, waste disposal, and chemicals were passed in the mid-1970s. Key legislation for the protection of natural environment and landscapes also dates back to these decades. Also, many of the participants in the radical movement of 1968 would move into the green movement. Representation of ecological concerns in French politics began in 1974 with the presidential candidacy of René Dumont. He didn't make it. Um, and it continued at municipal elections in 77, legislative elections in 78, European elections in 79, and again, the presidential elections in 1981. The French Green Party was founded in 1984, and I, as indicate here, it um, changed into a European uh, association in 2010. So reflecting in 1975 on the founding of the Ministry en in the Environment four years earlier in 71, its first minister, was minister between 71 and 74, Robert Poujade, who also for 30 somewhat years was the mayor of the city of Dijon, stated, it has often been said that all we do is reproduce with a time lag of a few years the evolution of American society. But he concluded with asserting the political responsibility for France to assume the future otherwise than as an unavoidable fatality or destiny. It's a dif difficult word to, uh, to translate. Um, so from what I have br briefly outlined for you here, there seems to be solid evidence that France provides fertile ground for the cultivation of environmental concerns in its continuous proto-ecological thinking, research, and actions that originated before the French Revolution. Thank you. Monica. So um, is this, this where your um, uh, book ends is uh, 1974, or uh, do, you, do you take it further into the Green Party? Um, the, my, my book ends in 1980, and it deals with the Lotman Gardens. So this is, this is really an offshoot of that. You know, I, I started looking into that to, to write the paragraph that I needed for the book, and I just got hooked. And I said, wait a minute, you know, what, what's going on here? There is some really interesting stuff. And so um, this is what? So this is, this is really very much in the formative stages of my, my research, but I, I really feel and I want to keep 
working with it because there is really such a strong argument for how much, you know, for not dismissing France as not having been party to the early um, ecological thinking. They just were doing it differently and they weren't speaking in the same terms. I have so many questions because it, it uh, intersects with my, my teaching of environmental history and um, some of my interests as well. Um, so uh, maybe, maybe for the, the benefit of the group, I'll ask um, uh, what the impact was then um, on the use of pesticides. Did they ban DDT? Um, what, uh, you know, uh, post, they, they post the translation they, of they, they did eventually, but it was, um, they, they weren't prepared to recognize, but then eventually you have a legislation against pesticides. And, and obviously there's been a good 45 years since, so you know, things have evolved. So I just happened to be reading a biography about Alexander von Humboldt, and I wonder, I mean, he was very active in Paris, loved France before and after the uh, French Revolution, <clears throat> and he is credited with being the father of the invention of nature as an organic whole. Uh, and he traveled through a lot of French colonies and was very critical of the way the French government was exploiting the resources in the colonies. So I kind of wonder if you have A, run into him, and B, this interaction among scientists in uh, German-speaking areas in France and in England seems to be an important part of the story. That is uh, very much uh, what I am finding, that actually histories of uh, environment, the history of the environmental movement in Europe, for instance, uh, that are written by French authors, very much give credit to the fact that this was an international movement. And then one definition would be done by somebody in Germany, it would be picked up. The scientific community was in touch with each other, and Humboldt definitely traveled all over, and he was extremely influential. But um, I just was interested in tracing a line of French thinking and French activities that show that they were also, because they're usually dismissed, you know, they didn't invent the word ecology, they didn't invent the, the concerns about the environment, so they weren't doing anything. And so I was trying to prove the other word. otherwise, which is why I was, except for Carson, who really seems to have sparked a, you know, a worldwide awareness, um, I didn't mention any other foreign. Well, I mean, he had a lot of close friends in the scientific community in France and gave mm -hmm. him a lot of credit for the way he thought about things. So right. clearly, it's sort of news to me that people think there isn't an environmental movement fairly early in France. And I wonder if it's because it is tied to the elite, uh, you know, before the revolution and the preservation of the forest. Well, there's, there's definitely a break with the revolution that occurs, and it's, it's a break of over 20 years. They don't reestablish the school and the legislation until, you know, 25 years into the, uh, the new regime after. So you have the break of the re revolution and then the disturbance of the Napoleonic uh, wars. So all that. But, but they, were, they were in contact. They were talking. They knew. And, and Jefferson actually is in France. He goes to England to a nursery. And they want to show him all the English plants. They say, no, 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 I want to see all the American trees you have here so I can send them to France. Uh, because he was intent on making sure that those species were um, participating in the for reforestation effort that Louis XVI was involved in at the time. And he was sending them both to the, to the government agencies and to private landowners who were interested in managing their forests. It's so interesting, the exchange of species, which he considered to be a positive thing, and now we call it invasion of, you know, of foreign species that harm our own ecology. Mm -hmm. So the flip of that is just is really interesting. I was um, speaking about uh, Doug Talamy's book uh, about precisely cultivating native, native species, species etc. Uh, at a conference I went to in Germany. And they said, you know, we don't think in these terms because we've been having species coming from all over. There's no way for us to go back to native species. You know, we've been getting things from the Orient, et cetera, for millennia. You know, in this country, we can think of that and, and we watch the, uh, the impact of the native species who have done some pretty tremendous damage. Yeah, I want to throw in there that um, so my family uh, in Hungary was involved in um, uh, vineyards and the, the agriculture of wine. Um, 
my my uh, my mother's uncle was uh, head of the state farms during the um, communist years in, uh, in in Hungary, and in his um, when he came over to visit us and um, was sort of toasting uh, with wine, of course, <laughs> of the connection between the Americans and the Hungarians. He said, you know, your uh, your grapes saved ours right. because um, there was a disease, a blight of the grapes, and by bringing in the wild American varieties and grafting them onto the varieties that they were growing there, they saved their vineyards. Right. Yeah. So it, it's not yeah. always a negative, um, this exchange of species. So, it's yeah. The attack of Felix Serer in the 1860s devastated the entire European uh, wine production industry. And it is thanks to the American you know, plants that had been exported uh, in the decade before. But wouldn't most ecologists argue because that's because they over cultivated it to begin with in Europe and over specialized and probably some species just dominated so they didn't have the genetic variety that they should have had. It was a monoculture. Yeah. yeah. It's definitely a monoculture. Although they had different species, but for some reason, just like when the potato blight hit, you know, it was indiscriminate. It hit all, all the varieties of potatoes. There was a big crash of corn in the United States in the 1980s, and it was the same thing. Just mm -hmm. a few varieties were being cultivated, and mm -hmm. that blight got in them, and that was it. But, but we, have, we have kind of increased the, the danger by reducing the number of species, species that, are, uh, that are being cultivated systematically except for the little heirloom tomato packs you can buy. Yeah. Right. I have a question. After World War II, what role do people writing from the overseas departments and territories play in the ecological movement? By that time, uh, the colonies are really being um, divested. You know, the war of Algeria. Algeria becomes independent in 1960. Tunisia had already, Morocco had already seceded. So the, 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 col the colonial empires collapse basically, and the countries, 47 for India, you know, so those issues, the, the, the French government is trying to deal with the influx of the population of the colonial people coming back, accompanied by people, uh, natives from these, country who all, these countries who also come in uh, and change the color of the, the French population. Uh, so that's no longer a concern. They're no longer responsible for managing these forests. Uh, some uh, uh, French scientists would actually go back to the colonies as advisors and everything, but in a different in a different capacity. So it's, it's no longer it's no longer a, well, a concern. Like, there are places though that stay part of, of France, basically, right in the Pacific, in the Caribbean. These don't enter into the sort of ecological thinking or rethinking of happening in metropolitan France at all. Not at that. Point. I mean, they, they just can, kind of, I think, become assumed because when you were dealing with a vast colonial empire, this was all entire Madagascar had to be dealt with, you know. Now you're dealing with uh, a much, much smaller uh, and also older colonies where things were more established, you know, the, the ways of doing things were more established. And those are the ones that have kind of stayed as uh, part of the France. Do I have one more question? <laughs> um, I'm thinking forward to um, uh, the protests against, um, you know, the, the large in industrial agriculture in the United States and the global economy and um, McDonald's coming in and, uh, you know, the French, French farmers and, and, and the French bulldozing McDonald's <laughs> construction and uh, the, the slow food movement uh, of, I, I think it's the 90s, um, uh, certainly by, by 2000. And I wonder if some of the, um, the emphasis on the French rural countryside and cultivated species um, as part of the ecological movement carries over into uh, the um, protests against uh, homogenization of, of food and um, dominance of American products trying to come in? I think well, there, there is the, the infiltration of corporations in, uh, in the European context. But 
more powerful at that time is uh, the, the fact of the European Union when things are being brought together. And if you go buy your tomatoes, they come from uh, Holland. If you go buy your butter, it comes from Denmark. And things are no longer happening from the local. You know, so everything has been enmeshed into a huge um, system. And then the, the American corporations kind of come at the, the fringe of that. They're not part of that European enterprise. And what you see happening there is really a loss of, um, of a sense of a loss of agency, a loss of control of your own living circumstances that manifests itself in all kinds of cultural. So by that, by that time, by the time the EU really penetrates the life of people. Um, the ecological sensibility has happened. Uh, the protest against the development of nuclear energy has become uh, you know, a major concern, especially the way it was deployed in Europe, which was you know, more systematically than here. Um, and so people develop all kinds of local institutions, local um, historical society, local museums. They work very hard to resuscitate, and I think Anne Magnet Park talked about that, resuscitating, you know, when she was going to school, you could learn one of the local French languages. Um, so resuscitating all these things that spoke of their own ethnic identity. And it takes into cultivating species that are local onto, you know, resuscitating uh, gardens. All of those things are part of that whole cultural mindset of regaining agency and control of what your world, uh, your world is about, but within the context of the, the European Union and, and infiltrating um, American corporations, but they don't really dominate, they're not as power, well, they are powerful in what they do with their global, uh, you know, ramifications. But for the Europeans, all of this is being played out in the EU context with, and now we have Brexit. And the Scots wanting to go back in, so. You know. <laughs> no more questions? Thank you. Thank you for coming.